Welcome all to Majestic Peace Theater. Tonight, we will be presenting Richard Brinsley Sheridan's farcical comedy of manners, The Rivals, set in the British Idol of Bath in the county of Somerset, where the famed Roman baths are not, only, are not the only thing in which our comical cast of characters hope to take a dip in. Oh, a deliciously rollicking romp of hidden identities, internal family politics, and hopeless flirts. The rival shows us the path of love is never in a straight line. Let us begin on the cobbles of a narrow winding street in Bath as we meet up with two wily servants, Thomas and Fogg, as they discuss the courtships of their employers. Oh, Thomas, George is tea. What, Thomas, Thomas? Hey, odds life, Mr. Fogg. Give us your hand, my fellow old servant. Excuse my glove, Thomas. I'm devilish glad to see you. <laughs> Why, my prince of charioteers, you look as hearty. But who the deuce thought of seeing you in Bath? <laughs> My master thought another fit of the gout was coming to make him a visit. So would he to mind to get the slip and whip, we were all off in an hour's warning. Oh, I hasty in everything, or it would not be, Sir Anthony Absolute. <laughs> no, I do not, sir. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, but tell us, Mr. Fogg, how does your young master? Odd, oh, Sir Anthony will stare to see the captain here. I, I do not serve Captain Absolute now. Why, sure. At present, I am employed by Ensign Beverly. I doubt, Mr. Fogg, you haven't changed for the better. I have not changed, Thomas. No? Why didn't you say that you had left a young master? No. Well, honest Thomas, I must puzzle you no farther. Briefly, then, Captain Absolute and Ensign Beverly are one and the same person. The devil they are! <laughs> it is indeed, Thomas. Oh, do tell us, Mr. Fogg, the meaning of it. You know I have trusted you. You'll be secret, Thomas. As a coach horse. Why then, the cause of this is love. Love, Thomas. Love who has been a masquerader since the days of Jupiter. Aye, aye. I had guessed there was a lady in the case. But pray, why does your master pass only for instant? Now, if he had changed general indeed... Oh, Thomas, there lies the mystery of the matter. My master is in love with a lady of a very singular taste, a lady who likes him better as a half-pay ensign than if she knew he was son and heir to Sir Anthony Absolute, a baron of three thousand pounds. Oh, that's an odd taste indeed, but has she got the stuff, Mr. Fogg? Is she rich, eh? Rich! Oh, why, I believe she owns half the stocks. Sloan's <laughs> Thomas. She could pay the national debt as easily as I pay my washerwoman. <laughs> she has a lapdog that eats out of gold. She feeds her parrots with small pearls, and all her thread papers are made of banknotes. Bravo! Faith, but does she draw kindly with the captain? <laughs> as fond as pigeons. May one hear her name? Miss Lydia Languish. But there is a tough old aunt in the way, though, by the by. Uh, she has never seen my master. So we got acquainted with Miss while on a visit in Gloucester. Well, I wish they were once harnessed together in matrimony. But pray, Mr. Fogg, what kind of place is this bath? It is a good lounge. In the morning we go to the pump room, though neither my master nor I drink the waters. <laughs> After breakfast, we saunter on the parades or play at a game of billiards. At night, we dance. I have a damn the place. I am tired of it. The regular hours stupefy me. Not a fiddle or a card after 11. <laughs> However, Mr. Falkland's gentleman and I keep it up a little in private parties. Now, I'll introduce you there, Thomas. You'll like him much. Oh, sure. I know Mr. Dupin. You know his master is the Mary Madeline Julia. Uh, I had forgot. 
But Thomas, oh, you must polish a little. Now, now it is this wig. Oh, what the devil do you do with a wig, Thomas? None of the London whips of any degree were ton whips now. Oh, more is the pity. More is the pity, I say. But uh, hold, hold, mark, 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 Thomas. Zooks, tis the captain. Is that the lady with him? No, no, that is M Madame Lucy, my mistress maid. <laughs> they lodge at the house, but I must tell him the news. Odd, he's giving her money. Well, Mr. Fogg? Goodbye, Thomas. I have an appointment at Guide's Ports this evening at eight. Meet me there and we will make a little party. <laughs> we come to the home of Mrs. Malaprop, a woman of many, many, Many words, most of which confound even the most dignified and loquacious of speakers. She is the guardian of the much appreciated and desired hand of the lovely Lydia Languish. We join the fair Lydia in conversation with her maidservant Lucy, who has returned from the task of gathering up what <laughs> for most would be the contents of a small library. Indeed, ma'am, I traversed half the town in search of it. I don't believe there's a circulating library in Bath I ain't been at. And could you not get the reward of constancy? Oh, no, indeed, ma'am. Nor the fatal connection? No, indeed, ma'am. Nor the mistakes of the heart? No, ma'am. As ill luck would have it, Mr. Bull said Miss Suki Saunter had just fetched it away. Hey ho. Oh, did you inquire for the delicate distress? Oh, oh, the memoirs of Lady Woodford. Yes, indeed, ma'am. I asked everywhere for it, and I might have brought it from Mr. Fredericks, but Lady Slattern Lounger, who had just sent it home, had so soiled and dog's eared it. It won't fit for a Christian to read. Hey-ho. Yes, I always know when Lady Slatten has been before me. She has a most observing thumb, and I believe cherishes her nails for the convenience of making marginal notes. Well, child, what have you brought me? Oh, yeah, ma'am. Let's see. This is the Gordian knot. And this peregrine pickle. Here are the tears of sensibility and I'm free clinker. This is the memoirs of a lady of quality written by herself. And here, the second volume of the sentimental journey. <laughs> hey ho, hold, here's someone coming. Quick, see who it is. Surely I heard my cousin Julia's voice. Oh, Lord, ma'am, here is Miss Melville. Is it possible? My dearest Julia, how delighted am I? How unexpected was this happiness? True, Lydia, and our pleasure is the greater. But what has been the matter? You were denied to me at one at first. Ah, oh, Julia, I have a thousand things to tell you. But first, inform me what has conjured you to Bath. Is Sir Anthony here? He is. We are arrived within this hour. And I suppose he will be here to wait on Mrs. Malaprop as soon as he is dressed. Then before we are interrupted, let me impart to you some of my distress. I know your gentle nature will sympathize with me, though your prudence may condemn me. My letters have informed you of my whole connection with Beverly, but I have lost him, Julia. My aunt has discovered our intercourse by a note she intercepted and has confined me ever since. Yet, would you believe it, she has absolutely fallen in love with a tall Irish baronet she met one night since we have been here, as Lady McShuffles wrote. You jest, Lydia. No, oh, upon my word. She really carries on a kind of correspondence with him, under a feigned name, though, till she chooses to be known to him, but it is a Delia or a Celia, I assure you. Then surely she is now more indulgent to her niece? Oh, quite the contrary. Since she has discovered her own frailty, she has become more suspicious of mine. Then I must inform you of another plague, uh, that odious Acres is to be in Bath today, so that I protest I shall be teased out of all spirits. Come, come, Lydia. Hope for the best. Sir Anthony shall use his interest with Mrs. Malaprop. But you have not heard the worst. Unfortunately, I had quarrelled with my poor Beverly just before my aunt made the discovery, and I have not seen him since to make it up. 
What was his offence? Nothing at all. But oh, I don't know how it was. As often as we had been together, we had never had a quarrel. And somehow I was afraid he would never give me an opportunity. So, last Thursday, I wrote a letter to myself to inform me that Beverly was at that time paying his addresses to another woman. I signed it, Your Friend Unknown, showed it to Beverly, charged him with his falsehood, put myself in a violent passion, and vowed I'd never see him more. And you let him depart so, and have not seen him since? Twas the next day my aunt found the matter out. I intended to only have teased him three days and a half. And now I've lost him forever. If he is as deserving and sincere as you have re represented him to me, he will never give you up so. Yet consider, Lydia, you tell me he is but an ensign, and you have 30,000 pounds. But you know I lose most of my fortune if I marry without my aunt's consent, till of age, and that is what I have determined to do ever since I knew the penalty. Nor can I love the man who would wish to wait a day for the alternative. Nay, this is caprice. What? Does Julia tax me with caprice? I thought her love of Falkland had injured her to it. I do not love even his faults. Ah, oh, but apropos, you have sent to him, I suppose. Not yet, upon my word. Nor has he the least idea of my being in Bath. Sir Anthony's resolution was so sudden, I could not inform him of it. Well, Julia, you are your own mistress, though under the protection of Sir Anthony, yet have you, for this long year, been a captive to the caprice, the whim, the jealousy of this ungrateful Falkland, who will ever delay assuming the right of a husband, while you suffer him to be equally imperious as a lover? Nay, you are wrong entirely. We were contracted before my father's death. That, and some consequent embarrassments have delayed what I know to be my Falkland's most ardent wish. He is too generous to trifle on such a point. And for his character, you wrong him there too. No, Lydia, he is too proud, too noble to be jealous. If he is captious, tis without dissembling. If fretful, without rudeness, Unused to the fopperies of love, he is negligent of the little duties expected from a lover. Well, I cannot blame you for defending him, but tell me candidly, Julia, had he never saved your life, do you think you should have been attached to him as you are? Believe me, the rude blast that overset your boat was a prosperous gale of love to him. Gratitude may have strengthened my attachment to Mr. Falkland, but... I have loved him before he had preserved me. Yet surely that alone were an obligation sufficient. Obligation? Why, a water spaniel would have done as much. Well, I should never think of giving my heart to a man just because he could swim. Come, Lydia, you are too inconsiderate. Nay, I do but jest. What's here? Oh, ma'am, here is Sir Anthony Absolute. Just come on with your aunt. They'll not come here. Lucy, do you watch? Y yet I must go. Sir Anthony does not know I am here, and if we meet, he'll detain me to show me the town. I'll take another opportunity of paying my respects to Mrs. Malaprop when she shall treat me, as long as she chooses, with her select words so ingeniously misapplied without being mispronounced. Oh, love, Mom, they are both coming upstairs. Well, I'll not detain you, cuz. Uh, adieu, my dear Julia. I'm sure you are in haste to send to Falkland. There, through my room, you'll find another staircase. Adieu. Here, my dear Lucy, hide these books. Quick, quick, fling Peregrine Pickle under the toilet, put the innocent adultery into the whole duty of man, cram Ovid behind the bolster, there, uh, put the man of feeling into your pocket, so-so. Now leave Fordoyce's sermons open on the table. Tis a shame to hide such texts. Perhaps if the madam of the house had taken to reading more, she would benefit from the skill of a proper wordsmith. But I am getting ahead of myself. Why don't I let you all experience the charms of Mrs. Malaprop for yourselves? There! 
Sir Anthony, there sits the deliberate simpleton who wants to disgrace her family and lavish herself on a fellow not worth a shilling. <laughs> Madam, I thought you won. You thought, miss. I don't know any business you have to think at all. Thought does not become a young woman. But the point we would request of you is that you will promise to forget this fellow, to illiterate him, I say, quite from your memory. Ah, oh, madam, our memories are independent of our wills. It is not so easy to forget. But I say it is, miss. There is nothing on earth so easy as to forget if a person chooses to set about it. I am sure I have as much forgot your poor dear uncle as if he never existed. Why, sure, she won't pretend to remember what she's ordered not. Aye, this, this comes because of her reading. What <laughs> crime, madam, have I committed to be treated thus? And now don't attempt to extirpate yourself from the matter. You know I have proof controvertible of it. But tell me, will you promise to do as you bid? Will you take a husband of your friend's choosing? Madam, I must tell you plainly that had I no preferment for anyone else, the choice you have made would be my aversion. What business have you, miss, with preference and aversion? They don't become a young woman, and you ought to know that as both always were off to safest in matrimony to begin with a little aversion. But suppose we're going to give you another choice. Will you promise to give up this Beverly? Could I belie my thoughts so far as to give that promise, my actions would certainly as far belie my words. Take yourself to your room. You are fit company for nothing but your own ill humours. Willingly, madam. I cannot change for the worse. Oh, but there's a little intricate hussy for you. It is not to be wondered at, mum. All this is the natural consequence of teaching girls to read. Oh. Had I a thousand daughters, by heaven, I'd as soon have them taught the black art as their alphabet. Nay, nay, Sir Anthony, you are an absolute misanthrope. In, in my way hither, Mrs. Malaprop, I observed your niece's maid coming forth from a circulating library. Oh, those are vile places indeed. Yes, madam, a circulating library in a town is as an evergreen tree of diabolical knowledge. Oh, fie, fie, Sir Anthony, you surely speak laconically. <laughs> Why, Mrs. Malaprop, in moderation now, what would you have a woman know? Hmm. Observe me, Sir Anthony. I would by no means wish a daughter of mine to be a progeny of learning. I don't think so much learning becomes a young woman. Uh, for instance, I would never let her meddle with a Greek or Hebrew or algebra or paradoxes or such inflammatory branches of learning. Uh, neither would it be necessary for her to handle any of your mathematical, astronomical, diabolical instruments. But... Sir Anthony, I would send her at nine years old to a boarding school in order to learn a little ingenuity and artifice. Then, mm. sir, she would have a supercilious knowledge and accounts. And as she grew up, I would have her instructed in geometry that she might know something of the contagious countries. But above all, Sir Anthony, she should be mistress of orthodoxy, that she might not misspell or mispronounce words so shamefully as girls usually do, and likewise that she might reprehend the true meaning of what she is saying. <laughs> this, Sir Anthony, is what I would have a woman know. And I don't think there is a superstitious article in it. <laughs> well, well, Mrs. Malaprop, I will dispute the point no further with you. Though I must confess that you are a truly moderate and polite arguer. Oh. But, Mrs. Malaprop, uh, to the more important point in debate, you say you have no objection to my proposal? Oh, none, I assure you. I am under no positive engagement with Mr. Akers, and as Lydia is so obstinate against him, perhaps your son might have better success? <laughs> well, madam, I will write for the boy directly. Oh. He knows not a syllable of this yet, though I have for some time had this proposal in my head. He is at present with his regiment. Hmm. 
We have never seen your son, Sir Anthony, but I hope no objection on his side. Objection? Let him object if he dare. No, no, Mrs. Malaprop. Jack knows that the least demur puts me in a frenzy directly. Uh, <laughs> aye, in the properest way. Oh, my conscience. Nothing is so conciliating to young people as severity. Well, mm -hmm. Sir Anthony, I shall give Mr. Akers his discharge and prepare Lydia to receive your son's invocations. And I hope you will represent her to the captain as an object not altogether illegible. Madam, I will handle this subject prudently. Ah. Uh, well, I must leave you. Uh, and let me beg you, Mrs. Malaprop, to enforce this matter roundly to the girl. Take my advice. Keep a tight hand. If she rejects this proposal, clap her under lock and key. Such foolishness to think one could constrain young love behind shackles like that. <laughs> Have they not studied their Shakespeare? Telling a young soul no is hardly a deterrent. Well, at any rate, I shall be glad to get her from under my intuition. She has somehow discovered my partiality for so Lucius a trigger. Sure, Lucy can't have betrayed me. Oh, no, the girl is such a simpleton. I should have made her confess it. Uh, uh, Lucy! Lucy! Did you call, ma'am? Uh, yes, girl. Did you see Sir Lucius while you was out? No, indeed, ma'am. I no glimpse of him. You are sure, Lucy, that you never mentioned... Oh, him and I had sooner I cut my tongue out. Well, don't let your simplicity be imposed on. No, ma'am. So, uh, come to me presently, and I'll give you another letter to Sir Lucius. But mind, Lucy, if you ever betray what you are entrusted with, unless it be other people's secrets to me, you forfeit my malevolence forever. <laughs> So, my dear simplicity, let me give you a little respite. <laughs> let girls in my station be as fond as they please of appearing expert and knowing in their trusts. Commend me to a mask of silliness and a pair of sharp eyes for my own interest under it. Let me see to what account I have turned my simplicity lately. <laughs> for abetting Miss Lydia Languish in a design of running away with an ensign in money, sundry times, 12 pounds, 12 gowns, five hats, ruffles, caps, etc., etc., numberless. <laughs> From said ensign within this last month, six guineas and a half, about a quarter's pay, item from Mrs. Malaprop for betraying the young people to her, when I found matters were likely to be discovered, two guineas. Item from Mr. Akers for carrying divers letters, which I never delivered, <laughs> two guineas and a pair of buckles. Item from Sir Lucius O'Trigger, three crowns and a silver snuff box. Well done, simplicity. <laughs> Leaving behind the pleasures of a well-appointed and fashionable salon, we find ourselves now in the lesser lodgings of a bachelor's rented space. We join Captain Jack Absolute and his servant Fogg as they discuss the arrival of the one wrinkle that could complicate the romantic plot the good captain hopes to weave. Sir. Well, I was here, Sir Anthony came in. Uh, he sent me to inquire his health and uh, uh, to know if he was at leisure to see you. And what did you say on, on hearing that I was in Bath? Sir, in all my life, I never saw an elderly gentleman more astonished. He started back two or three paces, rapped out a dozen interjectual oaths and asked what the devil Well, sir, what did you say? I, well, sir, I lied. Well, I forgot the precise lie. You may depend on it. You got no truth from me. 
Yet with submission and fear of blunders in the future, I should be glad to fix what has brought us to this to bath in order that we may lie a little consistently. Sir Anthony's servants were curious, sir, very curious indeed. You have said nothing to them. Hey, not uh, Mr. Thomas, indeed, the coachman. Sir Death, you rascal, you have not trusted him. Oh, no, sir, not a syllable upon my veracity. He was a little inquisitive. I was sly. Oh, devilish sly. <laughs> my master, says I, honest Thomas, you know, one says to that to one's inferiors, uh, is to come to Bath to recruit. Now, yes, I said to recruit. Uh, <laughs> well, well, recruit we will do. Let it be so. It he is, is about to, sir. He's changing his dress. Can you tell whether he has been informed of Sir Anthony and Miss Melbourne's arrival? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I fancy not, sir. Uh, no one is since he came in but this gentleman. I think, sir, I hear Mr. Falkland coming down. Well, go tell him I am here. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I beg your pardon, sir, but should Anthony call, uh, will you do me the favor to remember that we are recruiting, sir, if you please? Well, well. Though I never scruple a lie to serve my master, yet it hurts one's conscience to be found out. <laughs> now for my whimsical friend. If he doesn't know that his mistress is here, I'll tease him a little before I tell him. The good captain may feel absolute in confidence of his coy plans and of his clever subterfuge, but the footsteps now ambling down the steps of the inn with a nervous irregularity belies a soul less convinced of his romantic hopes. Falkland, his thoughts tormented by the many potential fault lines crisscrossing the course of his courtship, enters. Falkland, you're welcome to Bath again. You are punctual in your return. What news since I left you? Uh, how stand matters between you and Lydia? Faith. Much as they were, I have not seen her since our quarrel. However, I expect to be recalled every hour. Why don't you persuade her to go off with you at once? What? A and lose two thirds of her fortune? If you are sure of her, propose to the aunt in your own character, and write to Sir Anthony for his consent. Softly, softly, for though I am convinced my little Lydia would elope with me as Ensign Beverly, yet I am by no means certain that she would take me with the impediment of the consent of our guardians. A, a regular humdrum wedding and the reversion of a good fortune on my side. No, no, I must prepare her gradually for the discovery before I risk it. Well, but, Falkland, you'll dine with us today at the hotel. Indeed I cannot. I'm not in spirits to be of such a party. By heavens, I shall forswear your company. You are the most teasing, captious, incorrigible lover. I own I'm unfit for company. Am I not a lover? I? And a romantic one, too? Yet do I carry everywhere with me such a confounded farrago of doubts, fears, hopes, wishes, and all? What grounds of apprehension can your whimsical brain conjure up at present? What grounds for apprehension, did you say? Heavens, are there not a thousand? Oh, I fear for her spirits, her health, her life. My absence may fret her, her anxiety for my return. Her fears for me may oppress her gentle temper. And for her health, oh, does not every hour bring me cause to be alarmed? If it rains, some shower may even then have chilled her delicate frame. If the wind be keen, some rude blast may have affected her. The heat of noon, the dews of the evening, may endanger the life of her, for whom I only value mine. Oh, Jack, when delicate and feeling souls are separated, there is not a feature in the sky, not a movement of the elements, not an aspiration of the breeze, but hints some cause for lover's apprehension. Aye, but we may choose whether we will take the hint or not. So then, Falkland, if you were convinced that Julia were well end in spirits, you would be entirely content. I should be happy beyond measure. I'm anxious only for that. 
Then to cure your anxiety at once, Miss Melville is in perfect health and is at this moment in Bath. Nay, Jack, don't trifle with me. He has arrived here with my father within the hour. Oh, my dear friend, now nothing on earth can give me a moment's uneasiness. Uh, Mr. Akers just arrived, it's below. Falkland, this, this Acres lives within a mile of Sir Anthony, and he shall tell you how your mistress has been ever since you left. Uh, Fogg, show the gentleman up. What? Is he much acquainted in the family? Oh, very intimately. Besides, his character will divert you. Well, I should like to ask him a few questions. He is likewise a rival of mine, that is, of the other's self, for he does not think his friend Captain Absolute ever saw the lady in question, and is it is ridiculous enough to hear him complain to me of one Beverly, a conceding, skulking rival who... Hush! He's here! Oh, my dear friend, noble captain, and honest Jack, how dost thou? Just arrived faith, as you see. So your humble servant. Warm work on the roads, Jack. Mm, odds, whips, and wheels. I've traveled like a comet with a tail of dust all the way as long as the mall. Ah, Bob, you are indeed an eccentric planet, but we know your attraction here. Give me leave to introduce Mr. Falkland to you. Mr. Falkland, Mr. Akers. Sir, I am most heartily glad to see you, sir. I solicit your connections. Hey, Jack. What this is, Mr. Falkland, who, uh... I thought Mr. Melville's Mr. Falkland. Odd so. She and your father can be just arrived before me. Uh, I suppose you have seen them. Ah, uh, Mr. Falkland, you indeed, you are indeed a happy man. I have not seen Miss Melville yet, sir. Uh, I hope she enjoyed full health and spirits in Devonshire. Oh, never knew her any better in my life, sir. Never better. Indeed. I did hear that she had been a little indisposed. False, false, sir. Only said to vex you. Quite the reverse, I assure you. There, Jack. You see, she has the advantage of me. I had almost fretted myself ill. Now, are you angry with your mistress for not having been sick? No, no. You misunderstand me. Yet surely a little trifling indisposition is not an unnatural consequence of absence from those we love. Now confess, isn't there something unkind in this violent, robust, unfeeling health? Oh, it was very unkind of her to be well, unwell in your absence, to be sure. <laughs> well, sir, but you were saying that Miss Melville has been so exceedingly well. What then she has been merry, I suppose? Merry odds crickets? She has been the bell and spirit of the company wherever she has been. So lively and enter entertaining, so full of wit and humor. There, Jack, there. What? Happy and I away? Have done. <sighs> How foolish this is. Just now you were only apprehensive of your mistress's spirits. Why, Jack, have I been the joyless spirit of the company? No, indeed, you have not. Have I been lively and entertaining? Oh, upon my word, I acquit you. Have I been full of wit and humour? No, Faith, to do you justice, you have been confoundly stupid indeed. Why, I should be glad to hear my mistress had been so merry, sir. Nay, nay, nay. I'm not sorry that she has been happy. No, no, I'm glad of that. I would not have her sad or sick. Yet surely a sympathetic heart would have been shown itself. She might have been temporarily healthy and somehow plaintively married. But she has been dancing too, I doubt not. Aye, truly does she. There was at our last race ball... Uh... Hell and the devil! There, there! I told you so. I told you so. Oh, she thrives in my absence, dancing. But her feelings have been in opposition with mine. I've been anxious, silent, pensive, sedentary. My days have been hours of care, my nights of watchfulness. She has been all health, spirit, laugh, song, dance. Oh, damned, damned levity. For heaven's sake, Falkland, suppose she has danced. What then? I must leave you. 
Nay, but stay, Falkland, and thank Mr. Akers for his good news. Damn his news! <laughs> the gentleman wasn't angry at my praising his mistress, was he? A little jealous, I believe, Bob. You don't say so? <laughs> jealous of me? <laughs> That's a good joke. There is nothing strange in that, Bob. Let me tell you, that sprightly grace and insinuating manner of yours will do some mischief among the girls here. <laughs> you joke, <laughs> mischief. <laughs> but you know I am not my own property. My dear Lydia has forestalled me. She could never abide me in the country because I used to dress so badly. But odds, frogs, and timbers, I'll make my old clothes know who's master. Uh, my hair's been in training some time. Indeed. Aye, and though if the side curls are a little restive, my hind part takes it very kindly. Ah, you'll polish, I doubt not. Absolutely, I propose so. <sighs> then if I can find out this ensign Beverly, odds, triggers, and flints, I'll make him know the difference out. So, there is a gentleman below desires to see you. Shall I show him into parlour? Aye, you may. Well, I must be gone. Say, who is it, Fogg? Uh, your father, sir. You puppy, why didn't you show him up directly? <laughs> uh, you have business with Sir Anthony. I expect a message from Mrs. Malaprop at my lodgings. I have also sent also for my dear friend, Sir Lucius O'Trigger. <sighs> Adieu, Jack. We must meet at night. That I will with all my heart. Now, for a parental lecture. I hope he has not heard nothing of the business that brought me here. I wish the gout had held him fast in Devonshire with all my soul. Sir, I am delighted to see you here looking so well. Your sudden arrival at Bath made me apprehensive of your health. Very apprehensive, I dare say, Jack. Uh, what, you're recruiting here, eh? Yes, sir, I am on duty. <laughs> well, Jack, I'm glad to see you, though I, I did not expect it, for I was going to write you on a little matter of business. Uh, Jack, uh, I've been considering that I, I grow old and infirm, and, and shall probably not trouble you long. Pardon me, sir, I never saw you look more strong and hearty, and, and I pray frequently that you may continue so. Uh, I hope your prayers may be heard with all my heart. Well then, Jack, I've been considering that I am so strong and hearty that I may continue to plague you for a long time to come. <laughs> now, Jack, I am sensible that the income of your commission and what I have hitherto allowed you is but a small pittance for a lad of your spirit. Sir, you are very good. I have resolved, therefore, to fix you at once in a noble independence. Sir, your kindness overpowers me. Such generosity makes the gratitude of reason for more lively than the insensations ever of the filial affection. I'm glad you're so sensible of my attention, and you shall be the master of a large estate in just a few weeks. Let my future life, sir, speak my gratitude. I, I cannot express the sense I have of your munificence. Yet, sir, I, I presume you would not wish me to quit the army. <laughs> oh, well, that shall be your, as your wife chooses. <laughs> My wife, sir? Aye, your wife, yes. Why, did I not mention her before? Not a word, sir. Odd so. I, I mustn't forget her, though. Uh, yes, Jack, the independence that I was talking of is, is by marriage. Uh, the fortune is saddled with a wife, you see. Uh, but I suppose that makes no difference. Sir, sir, you amaze me. Why the devil, what's the matter? Just now, you were all gratitude and duty. I was, sir. You take me to be of independence and fortune, but not a word of a wife. Why, what difference does that make? All's life, sir. If you have the estate, you must take it with the livestock on it as it stands. If our happiness is to be the price, I must beg leave to decline the purchase. Pray, sir, who is this lady? What's that to you, sir? Come, give me your promise to love and marry her directly. Sure, sir, this is not very reasonable to summon my affections for a lady I know nothing of. 
I am sure, sir, tis more unreasonable in you to object to a lady you know nothing of. Then, sir, tell me, must you plainly that my inclinations are fixed on another? My heart is engaged to an angel. Then pray let it send an excuse. But my vows are pledged to her. Harky, Jack, I have heard you for some time with patience. I have been cool, quite cool. But take care. You know I am compliant itself when I am not thwarted. No one more easily led when I have my own way. But don't put me in a frenzy. Sir, in this I cannot obey you. Now Damn me if I ever call you Jack again while I live. This is reason and moderation indeed. None of your passion, sir. None of your violence, if you please. It won't do with me. I promise you. Indeed, sir. I am never was crueler in my life. Oh, tis a confounded lie. I know you are in a passion in your heart. Nay, sir, upon my word. So you will fly out. Can't you be cool like me? What the devil good could passion do? Passion is of no service. You impudent, insolent, overbearing reprobate. You play upon the meekness of my disposition. Yet take care. The patience of a saint may be overcome at last. But mark. I give you six hours and a half to consider this. If you then agree without any condition to do everything on earth that I choose, why, confound you, I may in time forgive you. If not, zooms, don't enter the same hemisphere with me. Don't dare breathe the same air or use the same light with me. If you got to get an at atmosphere and son of your own, I'll disown you, I'll disinherit you, I'll unget you. And damn me if I ever call you Jack again. Mild, gentle, considerate father, what a tender method of giving his opinion in these matters, Sir Anthony has. I dare not trust him with the truth. Surely, sir, your father is wrath to a degree. He comes down the stairs eight or ten steps at a time, muttering, growling, thumping the banisters all the way. Upon my credit, sir, were I in your place and found my father such very bad company, I should certainly drop his acquaintance. Cease your impediments, sir, at present. Did you come for nothing more? Stand out of the way. So, Sir Anthony trims my master. He is afraid to reply to his father and then vents his spleen on poor Fogg. Wandering through the narrow streets off the ancient city, we find one, the wily maid Lucy, fretting over the growing list of suitors she must handle for her mistress. The job of a loyal servant is never an easy one, but to corral the burning passions of so many men, all vying for the same fair and well-financed hand, Tis the gossip any servant cannot help but revel in. So I shall have another rival to add to my mistress list, Captain Absolute. However, I shall not enter his name till my purse has received notice in form. Oh, poor Acres is dismissed. Well, I have done him a last friendly office in letting him know that Beverly was here before him. Sir Lucius is generally more punctual. When he expects to hear from his dear Delia, as he calls her. <laughs> I wonder he's not here. I have a little scruple of conscience from this deceit, though I should not be paid so well if my hero knew that Delia was near 50 and her own mistress. Oh, my little ambassadors, upon me conscience. I've been looking for you. I've been uh, on the South Trade this half hour. Oh, Gemini, and I've been waiting for your worship here on the North. <laughs> Queer me, girl. Uh, have you got nothing for me? Oh, yes, but I have. Uh, oh, I've got the letter for you here in my pocket. Oh, faith. I guess you want to come empty handed. Well, let me see what the dear creature says. 
there, Sir Lucius. Ah, uh, sir, there is often a sudden incentive impulse in love that has a, a greater induction than years of domestic combination. Such was the commotion I felt at the first superfluous view of Sir Lucius of Trigger. Oh, oh very pretty upon me word. Female punctuation forbids me to say more. Made me add that it would give me joy infallible to find Sir Lucius worthy the last criterion of my affections. Dahlia, oh, upon me conscience. Lucy, your lady is a great mistress of language. Faith, she's quite the queen of the dictionary. Aye, sir, a lady of her experience. Experience? What? At 17. Oh, 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 true, sir. But then she reads so. Oh, my stars, how she will read of and. Faith, she must be very deep read to, to write this way. Though she rather is an arbitrary writer, too, for here are great many, many poor words pressed into the service of this node that would get her habeas corpus from any court in Christendom. Ah, Sir Lucius, if you were to hear how she talks of you. Oh, tell her I'll make her the best husband in the world uh, and lady you trigger into the bargain. <laughs> but we, we must get the old gentlewoman's consent and do everything fairly. Nay, Sir Lucius, I thought you weren't rich enough. Ah, upon my word, young woman, you have hit it. However, my pretty girl, fair. Here's a little something to buy your ribbon. And meet me in the evening, and I'll give you an answer to this. <laughs> so, so, ma'am, I humbly beg pardon. Oh, love, now, Mr. Fogg, you flurry one so. Come, come, Lucy. Here's no one by, so a little less simplicity, with a grain or two more sincerity, if you please. You play false with us, ma'am. I saw you give the baronet a letter. Yeah, my master shall know this. And if he don't call him out, I will. Wow. Whoa. But you gentlemen's gentlemen are so hasty. That letter was from Mrs. Malaprop Simpleton. She is taken with Sir Lucius. <laughs> oh, what taste some people have. But what says our young lady? Any message to my master? Oh, sad, sad news, Mr. Fogg. A worse rival than Acres. Sir Anthony Absolute has proposed his son. What? Captain Absolute? Even so, I overheard it all. <laughs> oh, very good faith. Oh, uh, goodbye, Lucy. I must away with this news. Well, you may laugh, but it is true. I assure you. Oh, but, Mr. Fogg, Tell your master not to be cast down by this. Oh, he'll be disconsolate. Oh, and charge him not to think of quarreling with young Absolute. Oh, never fear, never fear. Be sure, bid him keep up his spirits. Uh, we will, we will. When a plan well laid appears to be coming to fruition, Captain Jack Absolute flush with what he hopes to be the first of many victories, now savors for but a moment the step closer to his great desires. No, celebrations will have to wait for greater achievements, for there is still work to be done. <laughs> Oh, this justice folk told me whimsical enough, Faith. <laughs> My father wants to force me to marry the very girl I am plotting to run away with. <laughs> he must not know of my connection with her yet a while. However, I'll read my recantation instantly. My conversion is something sudden indeed, but I can assure him it is very sincere. So, so... Oh, here he comes. He looks plaguy gruff. No, I'll die sooner than forgive him. Die, did I say? I lived these 50 years to plague him, and our last meeting his impudence had almost put me out of my temper. An obstinate, passionate, self-willed boy. Who can he take after? 
Oh, this is my return for getting him before all his brothers and sisters. I never will see him more. Never. Never. Never! Uh, now for a penitential face. Dello, get out of my way. Uh, sir, you see a penitent before you. I see an impudent scoundrel before me. A sincere penitent. I, 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 I am come, sir, to acknowledge my error and to submit entirely to your will. What's that? I have been weighing and, and balancing what you were pleased to mention concerning duty and obedience and authority, sir, and the result of my reflections is a resolution to sacrifice every inclination of my own to your satisfaction. And now you talk sense, absolute sense. Uh, I never heard anything more sensible in my life. Confound you, you shall be Jack again. <laughs> I am happy in the appellation. Why then, Jack, my dear Jack, I will now inform you why and who this lady really is. Uh, nothing but your passion and violence, you silly fellow, prevented me from telling you at first. Uh, Prepare, Jack, for wonder and rapture. Prepare. What do you think of Miss Lydia Languish? Hmm? <laughs> Languish? What, the, the languishes of Worcestershire? Worcestershire? No, no. Uh, did you never meet Mrs. Malaprop and her niece, Miss Languish, who, who came into our country just before you were last ordered to your regiment? Hmm? Maliprop, Languish. Yes. I don't remember ever to have heard the names before. If, if I please you in this affair, it is all I desire. I am entirely at your disposal, sir. And your respect and duty. But, but come along with me. I'll write a note to Mrs. Maliprop, and you shall visit the lady directly. If only the course of love could run so smooth for all. We find one Falkland waiting in the dressing room of his beloved Julia, lost in the swirling ebbs and flows of his self-imposed neurosis. Will he talk himself out of the love of a fair and witty young woman? They told me Julia would return directly. I wonder, is she not yet to come? How mean does this captious, unsatisfied temper of mine appear to be my cooler judgment? I am ever ungraciously fretful and madly capricious. I am conscious of it, yet I cannot correct myself. What tender, honest joy sparkled in her eyes when we met. How delicate was the warmth of her expression. I was ashamed to appear less happy. She's coming. Yes, I know the nimbleness of her tread when she thinks her impatient Falkland counts the moments of her stay. I had not hoped to see you again so soon. Could I, Julia, be contented with my first welcome, restrained as you were by the presence of a third person? Oh, Falkland, when your kindness can make me thus happy, let me not think that I discovered something of coldness in your first salutation. "'Twas but your fancy, Julia. I was rejoiced to see you. To see you in such health. Sure I had no cause for coldness. "'Nay, then. I see you have taken something ill. You must not conceal from me what it is.' "'Well, then, shall I own to you that my joy at hearing of your health and arrival here by your neighbour Acris was somewhat damped by his dwelling, much on the high spirits you had enjoyed in Devonshire. <clears throat> on your mirth, your singing and dancing. And I know not what, for such is my temper, Julia, that I should regard every mirthful moment in your absence as a treason to constancy. The mutual tear that steals tears down the cheek of parting lovers is a compact that no smile shall live there till they meet again. Can the idle reports of a silly bore weigh in your breast against my tried affection? They have no weight with me, Julia. No, no, I'm happy if you've been so. Yet, only say that you thought of Falkland in the dance. I never can be happy in your absence. Believe me, Falkland, I mean not to upbraid you when I say that I have often dressed sorrow in smiles, lest my friend should guess what had caused my tears. 
you were ever all goodness to me. Oh, I'm a brute. But when I but admit a doubt of your true constancy. If ever without such cause from you, as I will not suppose possible, you find my affections veering but a point, may I become a proverbial scoff for levity and base ingratitude. Ah, oh, Julia, that last, that last word is grating to me. I would have had no title to your gratitude. Such your heart, Julia. Perhaps what you have mistaken for love is but the warm effusion of a too thankful heart. For what quality must I love you? For no quality. To regard me for any quality of mind or understanding were only to esteem me. I see you are determined to be unkind. The contract which my poor father bound us in gives you more than a lover's privilege. Again, Julia, you raise ideas that feed and justify my doubts. Perhaps your high respect alone for this solemn compact has fretted your inclinations. What else has made a worthier choice? How shall I be sure, had you remained unbound in thought and promise, that I should still have been the object of your preserving love? Then try me now. Let us be free, strangers. As to what has passed, my heart will not feel more liberty. There now, so hasty, Julia, so anxious to be free. If your love for me were fixed and ardent, you would not lose your hold, even though I wished it. Oh, you have tortured me to the heart. I cannot bear it. I know not whither your insinuations would tend, but as they seem pressing to insult me, I will spare you the regret of having done so. I have given you no cause for this. In tears. Stay, Julia, but for a moment. Oh, the door is fastened. Julia, my soul, but for one moment. I hear her sobbing. So death, what a brute I am to use her thus. Yet stay. I, she is coming now. No, Faith, she is not coming either. Why, Julia, my love, Say but that you forgive me. Come, but to tell me that. No, this is being too resentful. Stay. She's coming too. I thought she would. No steadiness in anything. Her going away must have been a mere trick then. She sent see that I was hurt by it. I'll affect indifference. <laughs> no. Zoons. She's not coming. Nor don't intend it, I suppose. This is not steadiness, but obstinacy. Yet I deserve it. What, after so long an absence to quell with her tenderness? Twas barbarous. I should be ashamed to see her now. I'll wait till her resentment is abated, and when I distressed her so again, may I lose her for ever. Still in the flush of victory, at maneuvering his way back into his father's good graces, we now find the dashing young Captain Jack Absolute, his charms turned up a few more notches in the sitting room of one Mrs. Malaprop, the dragon that guards the fair maiden in her tower and the next obstacle to be overcome. What powers exist in the subtle flattery of a well-educated man of high status? Let us join them as he seeks to lavish upon the astute guardian the fullness of his gentlemanly ways of persuasion. You being Sir Anthony's son, Captain, would itself be a sufficient accommodation, but from the ingenuity of your appearance, huh, I am convinced you deserve the character here given of you. Permit me to say, madam, that as I never yet have had the pleasure of seeing Miss Lackwish, my principal inducement of this affair at present is the honor of being allied to Mrs. Maliprop, huh. of whose intellectual accomplishments, elegant manners, and unaffected learning, no tongue is silent. Oh, sir, you do me infinite honor. Uh, I beg, Captain, you'll be seated. A uh, few gentlemen nowadays know how to value the ineffectual qualities in a woman. 
It is but too true indeed, ma'am. Ah, he is the very pineapple of politeness. Uh, you are not ignorant, Captain, that this giddy girl has somehow contrived to fix her affections on a beggarly, strolling, eavesdropping ensign whom none of us has seen and nobody knows anything of. Oh, I have heard the silly affair before. I am not all prejudiced against her on the account. Ah, you are very good and very considerate, Captain. I am sure I have done everything in my power since I exploded the affair. Long ago, I laid my positive conjunctions on her, never to think of the fellow again. I have since laid Sir Anthony's preposition before her, but I am sorry to say she seems resolved to decline every particle that I did enjoin her. It must be very distressing indeed, ma'am. Oh, it gives me the hydrostatics to such a degree. I thought she had persisted from corresponding with him, but behold, this very day I have interceded another letter from the fellow, but I believe I have it in my pocket. Oh, the devil, my last note. Ha! Ah, there. Uh, perhaps you may know the writing? I, I think I have seen this hand before. Oh. Yes, I, I certainly must have seen this hand before. Uh, nay, but read it, Captain. My soul's idol, my adored Lydia, very tender indeed. A tender eye and profane too, on my conscience. I am excessively alarmed at the intelligence you send me, the more so as my new rival... Uh, that's you, sir. ...has universally the character of being an accomplished gentleman and a man of honour. Well, that's handsome enough. Oh, the fellow has some design in writing so. That he had. I'll answer for him, ma'am. <sighs> but go on, sir. You'll see presently. As for the old weather-beaten she-dragon who guards you, who can he mean by that? Me, sir! Me! He means me! There, what do you think now? Ah, but go on a little further. Impudent scoundrel. <sighs> it shall go hard, but I will endure her vigilance, as I am told the same ridiculous vanity, which makes her deck her dull chat with hard words which she don't understand. There, sir, an attack upon my language. What do you think of that? An aspersion upon my parts of speech. Was there ever such a brute? Sure, if I reprehend anything in this world, it is the use of my oracular tongue and a nice derangement of epitaphs. He deserves to be hanged and quartered. Let me see. Same ridiculous vanity. You need not read it again, sir. I, I beg your pardon, ma'am does also lay her open in the grossest deceptions from flattery and pretended admiration and impudent coxcomb, so that I have a scheme to see you shortly with the old Harridan's consent and even to make her a go-between in our interview. Was ever such assurance? But did you hear anything like it? He'll elude my vigilance, will he? Ha <laughs> ha, yes, he's very likely to enter these doors. We'll try to see who can plot best. So we will, ma'am, so we will. <laughs> A conceited puppy. <laughs> well, but Mrs. Malaprop, as the girl seems so infatuated by this fellow, suppose you were to wink at her corresponding with him for a little time. Huh. Let her even plot an elopement with him, then do you connive at, at her escape? While I, just in the nick, will have the fellow laid on his heels and fairly contrived to carry her off in his stead. Oh, I am delighted with the scheme. Never was anything better perpetrated. <laughs> but pray, could not I see the lady for a few minutes now? I should try her temper a, a little. Why, I don't know. I doubt she is not prepared for a visit of this kind. Oh, Lord, she won't mind. Only tell her absolutely. Beverly. Sir. Gentle, good tongue. 
Why did you say Beverly? Uh, oh, oh, I was only going to propose that you should tell her, uh, by way of jest, that it was Beverly who was below. She'll come down fast enough then. <laughs> huh. It would be a trick she well deserves. Besides, you know the fellow tells her he'll get my consent to see her. <laughs> Let him if he can, I say again. Let her come down here. <laughs> he'll make a go between in the interviews. <laughs> come down, I say, Lydia. Oh, I don't wonder at your laughing. <laughs> His impudence is truly ridiculous. Well, I'll go and tell her at once who it is. She shall know that Captain Absolute is come to wait on her, and I'll make her behave as becomes a young woman. As you please, ma'am. <laughs> One would think now that I might throw off all disguise at once and seize my prize with security, but such is Lydia's caprice that to undeceive were probably to lose her. I'll see whether she knows me. What a scene am I now to go through? Surely nothing can be more dreadful than to be obliged to listen to the loathsome addresses of a stranger to one's heart. There stands the hated rival, an officer too, but oh, how unlike my Beverly. I, I wonder he don't begin. Truly, he seems a very negligent wooer. Quite at his ease, upon my word. I'll speak first. Mr. Absolute. Ma'am? Oh, heavens, Beverly! Hush! Hush, my life! Softly be not surprised. I am so astonished, and so terrified, and so overjoyed. For heaven's sake, how came you here? Briefly, I, I have deceived your aunt. I, I was informed that my new rival was to visit here this evening, and contriving to have him kept away, I have passed myself on her for Captain Absolute. Oh, charming. And she really takes you for young Absolute? Oh, she's convinced of it. But we try for without precious moments. Such another opportunity may not occur. Will you then, Beverly? Consent to forfeit that portion of my paltry wealth, that burden on the wings of love? Oh, come to me, rich only thus, in loveliness. Bring no portion to me but thy love. It will be generous in you, Lydia, for, well, you know, it is the only dowry your poor Beverly can repay. How persuasive are his words. How charming will poverty be with him. Ah, my soul. What a life we will then live. Love shall be our idol and support. We will worship him with a monastic strictness, abjuring all worldly toys to center every thought and addiction there. Proud of calamity, we will enjoy the wreck of wealth, while the surrounding gloom of adversity shall make the flame of our pure love show doubly bright. By heavens, I would fling all good of fortune from me with a prodigal hand to enjoy the scene where I might clasp my Lydia, to my bosom, and say the world affords no smile to me but here. If she holds now, the devil is in it. Now could I fly with him to the Antipodes, but my persecution has not yet come to a crisis. I am impatient to know how the little miss deports herself. Uh, so pensive, Lydia. Is then your warmth abated? Warmth? Debated. So she has been in a passion, I suppose. No, nor ever can while I have life. An ill-tempered, oh, that's it, my arm. An ill-tempered little devil. She'll, she'll be in a passion all her life, will she? Think not the idle threats of my ridiculous aunt can ever have any weight with me. Ah, oh, very dutiful upon my word. Let her choice be Captain Absolute, but Beverly is mine. Huh. I am astonished at her assurance. To his face, to his face! Thus then, let me enforce my suit. Oh, will a young man down on his knees entreating for pity? I can contain no longer. Why, thou vixen, I have overheard you. Oh, confound her vigilance. Captain Absolute, I know not how to apologize for her shocking rudeness. So all is safe. 
I find. I, I have hopes, madam, that the time will bring the young lady. Oh, there's nothing to be hoped for from her. She's as headstrong as an allegory on the banks of Nile. Nay, madam, what do you charge me with now? Oh, why, thou unblushing rebel, didn't you tell me this gentleman to his face that you loved another better? Or didn't you say that you would never be his? No, madam, I did not. Oh, good heavens, what assurance! Oh, Lydia, Lydia, you ought to know that lying don't become a young woman. And didn't you boast that Beverly possessed your heart? Tis true, ma'am, and none but Beverly. Oh, hold, hold assurance, you shall not be so rude. Nay, pray, Mrs. Mariprop, don't stop the young lady's speech. She is very welcome to talk thus. It does not hurt me in the least, I assure you. Oh, you are too good, Captain, too amiably patient. But come with me, miss. Let us see you again soon, Captain. Remember what we have fixed. I shall, ma'am. Come, take a graceful leave of the gentleman. May every blessing wait on my Beverly, my loved Beverly. Hush the word in your throat. Come along, come along. It is oft said that the clothes make the man. In the affluent society who relish more in being seen to take the waters at Bath than to actually do so, First impressions can be everything. A tattered hem or a broken braid of gold thread is hardly a good way to ingratiate yourself, especially if the hand of a fair young woman of wealth is the reason you have taken up lodgings in the ancient Roman settlement. In his more humble of lodgings, we find Bob Akers and his servant as he attempts to woo the fair Lydia, bedecked in the best his new money could afford. But will it be enough to get past the hawk-like eyes of her chaperone? Indeed, David, do you think I become it so? Oh, you are quite another creature, believe me, by the mass. Uh, dress does make a difference, David. Uh, Tis all and all, I think. Uh, see if there are any letters for me. Uh, I will. Uh, by the mass, I can't help looking at your head. Oh, sink and slide, coupe, oh, confound the first inventors of cotillion, say I. Uh, they are as bad as algebra to us country gentlemen. <laughs> Here is Sir Lucius of Trigger to wait on you, sir. Uh, show him in. Hi, Mr. Akers. I'm delighted to embrace you. My dear Sir Lucius, I kiss your hands. Ah, oh, pay, my friend. What has brought you so suddenly to Bath? Faith, uh, I have followed Cupid's jack-o'-lantern and found myself in a quagmire at last. In short, I have ve been very ill-used, Sir Lucius. Uh, I don't choose to mention names, but look on me as a very ill-used gentleman. Hey, what is the case? I, I ask no names. Hmm? Oh, mark me, Sir Lucius. I fall as deep as need be in love with a young lady. Oh. Her, her friends take my part. I follow her to Bath. Hmm. Send word of my arrival and receive answer that the lady is to be otherwise disposed of. This, Sir Lucius, I call being ill-used. Very ill. Upon my conscience. Hey, can you divine the cause of it? Why, there's the matter. She has another lover, one oh. Beverly, who I am told is now in Bath. Mm. Odds, slanders, and lies, he must be at the bottom of it. I rival in the case is there. Hmm. And, and you think he's uh, supplanted you unfairly? Unfairly, to be sure he has. He could never have done it fairly. Well, then sure you know what is to be done. Uh, not I, upon my soul. We wear no swords here, but, but you understand me. What? Fight him? Aye, to be sure. What, what could I mean else? But he has given me no provocation. Now I think he's given you the greatest provocation in the world. Can a man commit a more heinous offence against another? Wonderful in love with the same woman. 
gad, that's true. Mm. I grow full of anger, Sir Lucius. Mm. I fire a pace, odds, hilts, and blades. Mm. Uh, I find a man may have a deal of valor in him and not know it. But couldn't I contrive to have a little right of my side? Well, that ever signifies right when your honor's concerned. Do, do you think Achilles or my little Alexander the Great ever inquired where the right lay? No, by my soul, they, they drew their broadswords and let the lazy sons of peace to settle the justice of it. Odds, flints, pens, and triggers. Aye. I'll challenge him directly. Aye. The thunder of your words has soured the milk of human kindness in my breast. Oh, sounds, as the man in the place says, I could do such deeds. Come, come, there, there must be no passion at all in the case. These things should always be done civilly. I must be in a passion, Sir Lucius. I must be in a rage. Oh, dear Sir Lucius, let me be in a rage, yeah. if you love me. Come, here's a pen and paper. Well, I would the ink were red. Hmm. How shall I begin? Oh, odd slanders and blades. I'll write a good hand, however. Pray, pray, compose yourself. Come. Oh, now, shall I begin with an oath? Uh, do, Sir Lucius, let me begin with a damn. Ah, oh, do the thing decently, like a Christian. Look, all right, begin now, sir. Uh, that's too civil by half. Uh, to prevent the confusion that might arise. Hmm? Well? Okay. From our both addressing the same lady. Aye, there's the reason. Same lady. Aye, aye. Well? I, I shall expect the company, your honor, of your company. Hey, that, that. Soon I'm not asking him for dinner. Oh, to, look, to settle our pretensions. Uh, let me see. Uh, aye, King's Meads Fields will do. Aye, right, in King's Meads Fields. Huh? <sighs> well, so that's done. Well, I'll fold it up presently. Uh, my own crest, hand and dagger, shall be the seal. Aye, I would do myself the honor to carry your message, but to tell you a secret, I believe I shall have such another affair on my own hands. There's a gay cotton here who put, who put a jest on me lately at the expense of me country. And I only want to fall in with the gentleman, you know, to call him out. By my valor, I should like to see you fight first. Odds life, I should like to see you kill him if it was only to get a little lesson. I shall be very proud of instructing you. Well, for the present, for remember now, when you meet your antagonist, do everything in a mild, an agreeable manner. Let your courage be as keen, but at the same time, as polished as your sword. It has been said that there are 10 commandments in which one should take heart when it comes to a duel of honor. I won't list them all, but one I would be remiss not to note is that perhaps it is best to go into a duel with, <clears throat> at the very least, a level head. Oh, the dangerous game that is being played before us, and some in their very rage do not seem to understand they are not the knight, but the pawn in someone else's plan. Spurred on by Sir Lucius O'Trigger's desire to, shall we say, knock out some of his competition, can Bob Akers be saved from his own desire to play equal to those who consider him nothing more than a country bumpkin? Then by the master, I would do no such thing. Never so Lucius so trigger in the kingdom should make me fight when I wasn't so minded. Won't. What will the old lady say when she hears of it? Ah, oh, David, if you had heard Sir Lucius, odd sparks and flames, he would have roused your valor. Uh, not he, indeed. I hate such bloodthirsty cormorants. But my honor, David, my honor. I must be careful of my honor. 
I buy the mass and I would be very careful of it. And I think in return, my honor couldn't do less than be very careful of me. Odds blades, David, no gentleman will ever risk the, uh, the loss of his honor. <laughs> this honor seems to me a most marvelous false friend. I truly a very courtier like servant. <laughs> Put the case. I was a gentleman, which, thank God, none can say of me. Well, my honor makes me quarrel with another gentleman of my acquaintance. So, we fight. Pleasant enough, that. Boo! I kill him. The more's my luck. Now, pray, who gets the profit of it? Why, my honor. But put the case that he kills me by the mass, I go to the worm, and my honor whips over to my enemy. No, David. In that case, oh, odds, crowns, and laurels, your honor follows you to the grave. Now that's just the place where I could make a shift to do without it. Zunes, David, you are a coward. Oh, it doesn't become my valor to listen to you. What shall I disgrace my ancestors? Oh. Think of that, David. Think what it would do, would it be to disgrace my ancestors? Under favor, the surest way of not disgracing them is to keep as long as you can out of their company. To go to them in such a haste, without a lead in your brains, I should think might as well be let alone. Our ancestors are very good kind of folks, but they are the last people I should choose to have a visiting acquaintance with. But, David, now, you don't think there is such very, very, very great danger, eh? Uh, uh, odds life, people often fight without any mischief done. By the mass, here to meet some light-headed fellow I want with his damned double-barreled sword and cut and thrust pistol. Oh, Lord bless us, it makes me tremble to think on it. Soon, I won't be afraid. Odds Balls and fury, you shan't make me afraid. Here is the challenge, and I have sent for my dear friend Jack Absolute to carry it for me. <laughs> well, heaven send we all be alive this time tomorrow. What's that? Uh, uh, goodbye, master. Now oh, get along, you cowardly, dastardly, croaking raven. What's the matter, Bob? A vile, sheep-hearted blockhead. Oh, if I hadn't the valor of St. George and the dragon to boot. But what did you want me with me, Bob? Oh, uh, there. To Ensign Beverly. So what's going on now? Uh, well, what's this? A challenge. I indeed. Why? You, you, you won't fight him, will you, Bob? Egad, but I will, Jack. Sir Lucius has wrought me to it. Oh, he has left me full of rage. And I'll fight this evening that so much good passion mayn't be wasted. But what have I to do with this? Why, as I think you're, you know something of the fellow, I want you to find him out for me and give him this mortal defiance. Well, give it to me, and trust me, he gets it. You are very kind. What it is to have a friend. Uh, you couldn't be my second, could you, Jack? Why, no, Bob, not in this affair. It would not be quite so proper. Well, then I, I must get my friend, Sir Lucius. <laughs> Sir Anthony Absolute is below, inquiring for the captain. I'll come instantly. Well, my little hero, success attend you. Stay. Stay, Jack. If Beverly should ask you what kind of man your friend Akers is, do tell him I'm a devil of a fellow. Will you, Jack? To be sure, I shall. Ah, do, do. <laughs> uh, and if that frightens him, he gad, perhaps he mayn't come. Uh, so tell him, generally I kill a man a week. Will you, Jack? I will, I will. Uh, I'll say you were called in the country Fighting Bob. Right. Right. Uh, 
Well, tis all to prevent mischief, for I don't want to take his life if I clear my honor. No? That's very kind of you. Why, uh, you, don't, you don't wish me to kill him, do you, Jack? No, upon my soul, I do not. Mm. Remember, Jack, a determined dog. Aye, aye, fighting Bob. It would seem it is not just among the suitors that we have a true battle of wits going on, for the discordant din of disagreements is playing out in the finely appointed sitting room of Mrs. Malaprop. Perhaps they truly haven't heeded my warning of the perils of interfering in the course of young love. But who can hold to their stubbornness the longest? Why, thou perverse one, tell me what you can object to him. Isn't he a handsome man? Tell me that. A genteel man? A pretty figure of a man? She little thinks whom she is praising. So is Beverly, ma'am. Oh, no caparisons, miss, if you please. Caparisons don't become a young woman. No, Captain Absolute is indeed a fine gentleman. Aye, the Captain Absolute you have seen. Then he's so well-bred, so full of alacrity and adulation, and has so much to say for himself, in such a good language, too. His physiognomy is so grammatical. Ah, then his presence is so noble. I protest when I saw him, I thought of what Hamlet says in the play. Um, Hesperian curls, the front of Job himself, an eye like Marge to threaten at command, a station like Harry Mercury knew, uh, something about kissing on a hill. Uh, however, the similitude struck me directly. How enraged she'll be presently when she discovers her mistake. Sir Anthony and Captain Absolute are here below, ma'am. Ah, show them up here. Now, Lydia, I insist on your behaving as becomes a young woman. Show your good breeding, at least, though you have forgot your duty. Madam, I have told you my resolution. I shall not only give him no encouragement, but I won't even speak to you or look at him. Here we are, Mrs. Malaprop, come to mitigate the frowns of unrelenting beauty. And difficulty enough, I had to bring this fellow. I, I don't know what's the matter, but had I not held him by force, he'd have given me the slip. Oh, you have infinite trouble, Sir Anthony, in the affair. Lydia, Lydia, rise, I beseech you, pay your respects. I hope, madam, that Miss Languish has reflected on the worth of this gentleman and the regard due to her aunt's choice and my alliance as well. Now, Jack, speak to her. Devil shall I do. You see, sir, she won't even look at me. Uh, whilst you are here, I, I knew she wouldn't. I, I told you so. Let, let me entreat you, sir, to leave us together. I wonder I haven't heard my aunt exclaim yet. Sure, she can't have looked at him. Perhaps the regimentals are alike and she is something blind. Well, I am sorry to say, Sir Anthony, that my affluence over my knees is very small. <laughs> Turn around, Lydia, I blush for you. May I not flatter myself that Miss Languish will assign what cause of dislike she can have to my son? <laughs> Why don't you begin, Jack? Speak, you puppy, speak! It is impossible, Sir Anthony, she can't have any. She will not say she has. <laughs> Why don't you answer? Uh, then, madam, I, I trust that a childish and hasty predilection will be no bar to Jack's happiness. Zounds, sir, why don't you speak? I think my lover seems as little inclined to conversation as myself. How strangely blind my art must be. <coughs> madam, <coughs> faith, sir. I am so confounded and, and, and so, so confused. I, I told you I should be so, sir. I, I knew it. The, 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 the tremor of my passion entirely takes away my presence of mind. 
But it doesn't take away your voice, fool, does it? Go up and speak to her directly. Uh, uh, Sir Anthony, uh, shall we leave them together? I uh, not yet, a stubborn uh, little vixen. Not yet. Uh, uh, what the devil are you at, Jack? Unlock your jaws, sir, or, or... Now, heaven, send she may be too sullen to look around. I, I, I must disguise my voice. Will not Miss Languish lend an ear to the mild accents of true love? Will not? <coughs> what the devil ails this fellow? Why don't you speak out? <laughs> not stand croaking like a frog. The, <coughs> the <coughs> excess of my awe <coughs> and my, my, my modesty quite choke me. So. Ah, your modesty again. I, I tell you what, Jack, if you don't speak out directly and glibly, too, I shall be in such a rage. So all will out. I see. Be not surprised, my lady. Suppress all surprise at present. Heavens, tis Beverly's voice. Sure he can't have imposed on Sir Anthony, too. Is this possible? My Beverly, how can this be my Beverly? Ah, oh, it's all over. Beverly? The devil, Beverly, what, what can this girl mean? This is my son, Jack Absolute. Oh, for shame. Your head runs so on that fellow that you have him always in your eyes. Beg Captain Absolute's pardon directly. I'll see no Captain Absolute but my loved Beverly. Soon's the girl's mad. Ah, her brain's been turned by reading. <laughs> oh, my conscience, I believe so. What do you mean by Beverly? You saw Captain Absolute before today. There he is, your husband that shall be. With all my soul, ma'am, when I refuse my Beverly. Oh, this, she's as mad as a, as Bedlam. Or has this fellow been playing us a rogue's trick? Come here, sir. Who the devil are you? Faith, sir, I, I'm not quite clear myself, but I'll, I'll endeavor to recollect. Are you my son or not? Answer for your mother, you dog, if you won't for me. Yes, sir, who are you? Oh. Mercy, I begin to suspect. Ye powers of impudence, befriend me. Uh, Sir Anthony, I, I most assuredly am your wife's son, and that I sincerely believe myself to be yours also. Yes. I hope my duty has always shown. Uh, Mrs. Malaprop, I am your most respected admirer, and shall be proud to add affectionate nephew. I need not tell my Lydia that, that she sees her faithful Beverly, who, knowing the singular generosity of her temper, assumed that name and station which has provided a test of the most disinterested love which he now hopes to enjoy in a more elevated character. So, there will be no elopement after all. <laughs> Upon my soul, Jack, thou art a very impudent fellow, to do you justice. <laughs> I think I never saw a piece of more consummate assurance. I'm glad that you're not the dull, insensible violet you pretended to be, however. <laughs> I'm glad you have made a fool of your father, you dog I am. <laughs> so, this was your penitence, your duty and obedience. I thought it was damned sudden. <laughs> you never heard the names before, not you. What, the, the languishes of Worcestershire? <laughs> oh, if you could please me in this affair, it was all you desired. Oh, you dissembling villain, you. <laughs> oh, Lud, Sir Anthony, a new <laughs> light breaks in upon me. Yes. Hey, now what, Captain, did you write the letters then? Oh, what? Am I to thank you for the elegant compilation of a old, weather-beaten dragon? Hey, oh mercy, was it you that reflected on my parts of speech? <laughs> come, come, Mrs. Malaprop. We must forget and forgive. <laughs> Odd's life. Matters have taken so clever a turn all of a sudden that, that I could find it in my heart to be so good-humoured. Sir Anthony, since you desire it, we will not anticipate the past. 
So mind, young people, our retrospection will be all to the future. Come, we must leave them together, Mrs. Malaprop. They long to fly into each other's arms, I warrant. <laughs> Jack, you rogue. Come, Mrs. Malaprop, we'll not disturb their tenderness. Theirs is the time of life for happiness. Youth's the season made for joy. Ho, <laughs> odds life, I'm in such spirits. I don't know what I could not do. <laughs> Permit me, ma'am. <laughs> yes, la la la, ah la la. I should, I should like to have a little fooling myself. <laughs> so much thought bodes me no good. So grave, Lydia. Sir. The damned monosyllable has frozen me. What, Lydia, now that we are as happy in our guardian's consent as in our mutual vows? Guardian's consent, indeed. Come, come, we must lay aside some of our romance. A little wealth and comfort may be endured after all, and, and your fortune and the lawyers shall make such settlements as... Lawyers? I hate lawyers. Nathan. We will not wait for their lingering forms, but instantly procure the license and... The license! I hate license! Oh, my love, be not so unkind. Thus let me entreat. What signifies kneeling when you know I must have you? Nay, madam, there should be no constraint upon my inclinations. I promise you, if I have lost your heart, I resign the rest. Oh, God. I must try what a little spirit will do. Then, sir, let me tell you, the interest you had there was acquired by a mean, unmanly imposition and deserves the punishment of fraud. What? You've been treating me like a child, humoring my romance and laughing, I suppose, to your success. <laughs> you wrong me, Lydia, you, you wrong me. Only here. So will I, fondly imagined we were deceiving my relations, and I flattered myself that I should outwit and incense them all. Behold, my hopes are to be crushed at once by my aunt's consent and approbation, and I am myself the only dupe is lost. But here, here, sir, is the picture, Beverly's picture, which I have worn day and night in spite of threats and entreaties. There, sir. And be assured, I throw the original from my heart just as easily. Nay, nay, ma'am. We will not differ as to that. Here. Here is Miss Liddy Languish. What a difference, eh? There is the heavenly assenting smile that, that the first gave soul and spirit to my hopes. Those are the lips which sealed a vow, as yet scarce dry in Cupid's calendar, and there the half resentful blush that would have checked the ardor of my thanks. Well, that's past, all over indeed. There, madam, in beauty, that copy is not equal to you. But in my mind, it merits over the original in being still the same, is such that I cannot find in my heart to part with it. Tis your own doing, sir. I, I, I suppose you are perfectly satisfied. Oh, most certainly. Short now, this is much better than being in love. <laughs> there's, there's, there's some spirit in this, what, what, what signifies breaking some scores of solemn promises. All that's of conse no consequence, you know. There is no bearing his insolence. <laughs> Come, we must interrupt your billing and cooing a while. This is worse than your treachery and deceit, you base ingrate. <laughs> what the devil's the matter now? Zoons, Mrs. Malaprop, this, this is the oddest billing and cooing I've ever heard. But what the deuce is the meaning of it? I, I'm quite astonished. Ask the lady, sir. Oh, mercy. I'm quite analyzed for my part. Why, Lydia, what is the reason of this? Ask the gentleman, ma'am. Zoons, I shall be in a frenzy. Why, Jack, you are not come out to be anyone else now, have you? Hey, sir, there's no more trick, is there? You are not like Cerberus, three gentlemen at once, are you? You'll not let me speak. I said the lady can account for this much, much better than I can. 
Ma'am, you once commanded me never to think of Beverly again. There is the man. I now obey you, for from this moment I renounce him forever. Oh, mercy and miracles, what a turn here is! Why, sure, Captain, you haven't behaved disrespectfully to my niece. <laughs> now I see it. <laughs> now I see it. You have been too lively, Jack. <laughs> Nay, sir, upon my word. Soon say no more, I tell you, Mrs. Malaprop shall make your peace, yes. Uh, you must make his peace, Mrs. Malaprop. Uh, you must tell her tis Jack's way. Uh, tell her tis all our ways. It runs in the blood of the family. <laughs> Come away, Jack. <laughs> Mrs. Malaprop, a young villain. Oh, Sir Anthony. Oh, fie, Captain. Prowling the North Parade. Self-assured of his clever ploy to take out a rival for the fair Lydia's hand in marriage, Sir Lucius O'Trigger waits, having learned of Jack's own vying for the very same hand, has decided he too must take up the guns to ensure his success. But will his mark take the bait? I wonder where this Captain Absolute hides himself. Upon me conscience, these officers are always in one's way in love affairs. Oh, isn't that a captain coming? Faith it is. Oh, who the devil is he talking to? So what fine purpose have I been plotting? I did not think her romance could have made her so damned ab absurd either to death. I was never in a worse humour in my life. I, I could cut my own throat or any other person's with the greatest pleasure in the world. I, I never could have found him in a sweeter temper for me purpose. Oh, to be sure, just come in the nick. Now, <clears throat> to enter into conversation with him, and so <laughs> quarrel gently. With regard to that matter, Captain, I must beg leave to differ in opinion with you. Upon my word, then you must be a very subtle disputant, because I, I happen to just then be giving no opinion at all. A man may think an untruth as well as speak one. Very true, sir, but if a man never utters his thoughts, I should think they might stand a chance of escaping controversy. Then, sir, you differ in opinion with me, which amounts to the same thing. What? You can drive out unless you mean to quarrel with me. I cannot conceive. I humbly thank you, sir, for the quickness of your apprehension. You have named the very team I would be at. Very well, sir, but I should be glad you would please to explain your motives. Aye, the quarrel is very pretty quarrel as it stands. We should only spoil it by, you know, trying to explain it. Just name your time and place. Well, sir, since you are so bent on it, let it be this evening here by the spring gardens, which will scarcely be interrupted. If it's the same to you, Captain, I should I take it as a particular kindness if you'd let us meet in Kingsmead Fields. I a little business will call there about six o'clock, and I may dispatch both matters at once. A little after six, then. Aye, so the matter's set up in me mind at ease. Oh, well met. I was going to look for you. Oh, Falkland, all the demons of spite and disappointment have conspired against me. What can you mean? Has Lydia changed her mind? I, just as the eyes do a person who squints when her love eye was fixed on me, to other her eye of duty was finally obliqued, and when duty bid her point the same way, after other turned on a swivel and secured its retreat with a frown, and to wind up the whole, a good-natured gentleman here has Beg leave to have the pleasure of cutting my throat. Prithee, be serious. Tis fact upon my soul, Sir Lucius. You know him by sight for several front, which I am sure I never intended as obliged me to meet him this evening at six o'clock. Tis on that account I wish to see you. You must go with me. Nay, there must be some mistake, sure. Sir Lucius shall explain himself, and I, dare say, and I dare say matters may be accommodated. But this evening, did you say? Oh, I wish it had been any other time, but I am myself a good deal ruffled by a difference I have had with Julia. 
my vile tormenting temper has made me treat her so cruelly that I shall not be myself to be all reconciled. By heavens, Falcon, oh. you don't deserve her. Oh, Chuck, this is from Julia. I dread to open it. I feared maybe the last words, perhaps to bid me return for her letters and restore. Oh, how I suffer for my folly. Yeah, let me see. <sighs> A uh, final sentence indeed. Tis all over with you, Faith. Nay, Jack, don't keep suspense. I hear them. As I am convinced that my dear Falklin, the own's reflections have already unbraided him with his last unkindness to me, I will not add a word on this subject. I wish to speak with you as soon as possible. Yours ever and truly, Julia. There, stubbornness and resentment for you. Why, man, you don't seem one whit the happier at this. Oh, yes, I am, but, but... Confound your butts. You never hear anything that would make another man bless himself, but you immediately damn it with a butt. Now, Jack, as you are my friend, own honestly, don't you think there is something forward, something indelicate in this haste to forgive? I have no patience to listen to you. I must go to settle a few matters. Let me see you before six. Remember, at my lodging. I feel his reproaches, yet I would not change this too exquisite nicety for the gross content with which he tramples on the thorns of love. His engaging me in this duel has started an idea in my head, which I will instantly pursue. <clears throat> I'll use it as the touchstone of Julia's sincerity and disinterestedness. If her love prove Prove Pierre and Sterling or my name will rest in it with honour. And once I've stammed it there, I lay aside my doubts forever. But if the dross of selfishness, the alloy of pride, predominant, it will be best to leave her as a toy for some less cautious fool to sigh for. The course of love never did run smooth indeed. To find the young and wise Julia brought to the verge of tears over not being trusted in the sincerity of her love by a man so inept not to read her carefully cultivated cues of affection. What greater loss can it be to be at the mercy of another's indecisiveness? Oh, this message has alarmed me. What dreadful accident can he mean? Why such charge to be alone? Oh, Falkland, how many unhappy moments? How many tears have you caused me? What means this? Why this caution, Falkland? Alas, Julia, I come to take a long farewell. Heavens, what do you mean? You see before you a wretch whose life is fortified. Nay, start not. The infirmity of my temper has drawn all this misery on me. I left you fretful and passionate. An untoward accident drew me into a quarrel. This event is that I must fly this kingdom instantly. Oh, Julia, had I been so fortunate as to call you mine entirely. Before this mischance had fallen on me, I should not so deeply dread my banishment. My soul is oppressed with some sorrow at the nature of your misfortune. Had these adverse circumstances arisen from a less fatal cause, I should have felt strong comfort in the thought that I could now chase from your bosom every doubt of the warm sincerity of my love. My heart has long known no other guardian. I now entrust my person to your honor. We will fly together. Then on the bosom of your wedded Julia, you may lull your keen regret to slumbering. Oh, Julia, I am bankrupt in gratitude. But the time is so pressing. It calls on you for so hasty a resolution. Why, you would wish some hours to weigh the advantages you forego, and what little compensation for Falkland you can make to beside his solitary love? I ask not a moment. Let us not linger. Perhaps this delay, uh, perhaps, perhaps this delay. Oh, it will be better I should not venture out again till dark. Yet, 
Am I grieved to think what numberless distresses will press heavy on your gentle disposition? Perhaps your fortune may, for may be forfeited by this unhappy act. I know not whether it is so, but sure that alone can never make us unhappy. The little I have will be sufficient to support us, and exile never should be splendid. Julia, I have proved you to the quick, and with this useless device I throw away all my doubts. How shall I plead to be forgiven this last unworthy effect of my restless, unsatisfied disposition? Has no such disaster happened as you related? I am ashamed to own that it was pretended. Hold it, Auckland. Then you are free from a crime which I before feared to name. Heaven knows how sincerely I rejoice. You use the tears of thankfulness for that. But that your cruel doubt should have urged you to an imposition that has wrung my heart gives me now a pang more keen than I can express. What heavens, Julia! Yet hear me. My father loved you, Falkland, and you preserved the life that tender parent gave me. In his presence, I pledged my hand, joyfully pledged it, where before I had given my heart. When soon after I lost that parent, it seemed to me that Providence had in Falkland shown me whither to transfer without a pause my grateful duty as well as my affection. Hence I have been content to bear from you what pride and delicacy would have forbid me from another. I will not upbraid you by repeating how you have trifled with my sincerity. I confess it all. Yet no, no. See it now. I see it is not in your nature to be content or confident in love. With his conviction, I will never be yours. Nay, but, but Julia, my soul and honor, if after this I... Uh, my faith has once been given to you. I never will barter it with another. I shall pray for your happiness with the truest sincerity and the dearest blessing I can ask of heaven to send you will be to charm you from that unhappy temper which alone has prevented the performance of our solemn engagement. All I request of you is that you will yourself reflect upon this infirmity and when you number up the many true delights it has deprived you of. Let it not be your least regret that I lost you the love of one who would have followed you in victory through the world. <laughs> oh, she's gone forever. There was an awful revolution in her manner that riveted me to my place. Oh, fool, don't barbarian. <sighs> cast as I am, with more imperfections than my fellow wretches. Kind fortune sent a heaven-gifted cherub to my aid, and, like a ruffian, I have driven her from my side. Ah, I must now haste to my appointment. Well, my mind is tuned for such a scene. Hey-ho! Though he has used me so, this fellow runs strangely in my head. I believe one lecture from my grave cousin will make me recall him. Oh, Julia, I am come to you with such an appetite for consolation. Blood, child, what's the matter with you? You have been crying. I'll be hanged if that Falkland has not been tormenting you. Something has flurried me a little. Nothing that you can guess at. I would not accuse Falkland. Ha! <laughs> Whatever vexations you may have, I can assure you mine surpass them. You know who Beverly proves to be? I will now own to you, Lydia, that Mr. Falkland had before informed me of the whole affair. So then, I see I have been deceived by everyone. But I don't care. I'll never have him. But, nay, Lydia... Why is it not provoking? When I thought we were coming to the prettiest distress imaginable. I projected one of the most sentimental elopements. So becoming a disguise, so amiable a ladder of ropes. So conscious moon, four horses, scotch parson, with such surprise to Mrs. Malaprop, and such paragraphs in the newspapers. Oh, I shall 
die with disappointment. I don't wonder at it. Now, sad reverse. What have I to expect but after a deal of flimsy preparation with a bishop's license and my aunt's blessing to go simpering up to the altar? Melancholy, indeed. How mortifying to remember the dear delicious shifts I used to be put to to gain half a minute's conversation with this fellow. How often have I stole forth in the coldest night in January and found him in the garden, stuck like a dripping statue. There would he kneel to me in the snow and sneeze and cough so pathetically, he shivering with cold and I with anticipation. Ah, oh, Julia, that was something like being in love. If I were in spirits, Lydia, I should chide you only by laughing heartily at you. But it suits more the situation of my mind at present, earnestly to entreat you not to let a man who loves you with sincerity suffer that unhappiness from your caprice, which I know too well caprice can inflict. Oh, Lord, what has brought my aunt here? So, so, here's fine work. Here's fine suicide, parasite, and simulation going on in the fields. And Sir Anthony not to be found to prevent the antistrophe. For heaven's sake, madam, what's the meaning of this? Well, that gentleman can tell you. Twas he who enveloped the affair to me. Do so. Will you inform us? What's the matter? Why, murder's the matter. Slaughter's the matter. Killing's the matter. But he can tell you the perpendiculars. Then prithee, sir, be brief. Why then, ma'am? As to murder, I cannot take upon me to say. As to slaughter, manslaughter, that's as the jury finds it. But who, sir? Who are engaged in this? Well, my master, ma'am. I speak of my master. Heavens! What, Captain Absolute? Oh, to be sure you are frightened now. But who are with him, sir? <laughs> my poor master. Under favour from mentioning him first. You know me, my lady. I am David. And my master is, of course, or was, a Squire Akers. And then comes Squire Falkland. Above all, there is that bloodthirsty Philistine, Sir Lucius O'Trigger. <gasps> Sir Lucius O'Trigger? Oh, mercy, have they drawn poor little dear Sir Lucius into the scrape? What are we to do, madam? Why fly with the utmost felicity to be sure to prevent mischief? Here, friend, can you show us the place? If you please, ma'am, I will conduct you. David, do you look for Sir Anthony? Uh, come, girls, this gentleman will exhort us. Uh, come, sir, you're our envoy. Lead the way and we'll proceed. What little is left to prove one's devotion and to regain the love so easily spurned and cast aside. To be found wandering through the street implement in hand can only go to show the desperation of Captain Jack Absolute, for all his best laid plans have blown up in his face. A short scene in the streets of Bath would raise as great an alarm as any mad dog. How provoking this is in Falkland. Never punctual. I, I, I shall be obliged to go without him at last. Oh, the devil. Here's Sir Anthony. How shall I escape him? Why, Jack? Jack Absolute. Really, sir? You have the advantage of me. I don't remember ever to have had honor. My name is Sanderson, at your service. Oh, uh, sir, I beg your pardon. Wait, wait. <laughs> you scoundrel! What tricks are you after now, huh? <laughs> oh, a joke, sir. A, a, a joke. Yes. Pray, Jack, where is it you are going? I, I was going, sir, to 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 to, to Lydia, sir, uh, to Lydia, to, to 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 make matters up if I I, I could. Oh yes. What will you say to Lydia? Uh, oh, sir, beg her pardon, uh, humour her, uh, promise and vow, but, but I detain you, sir. Consider the cold air on your gout. Oh, not at all. I'm in no hurry. Ah, uh, Jack, uh, you youngsters, when once you are wounded here... Uh, hey, what, what the deuce have you got here? What is nothing, that? Nothing, sir, not nothing. You know, what, what is this? It, it's something damned hard. A, a bubble for, for Lydia. 
Nay, let, let, let me see your taste. Hmm? A bob of Lydia, soon, sir. Uh, you're, you're not going to cut her throat, are you? Sir, so I'll explain to you. You know, sir, uh, so Lydia is romantic, devilish romantic, and, and very absurd, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, sir, I intend, if she refused to forgive me, to unsheath this sword and, and swear or, or fall upon its point and expire at <laughs> Fall upon a fiddlestick's end. <laughs> I suppose it's the very thing that would please her. Uh, get along, you fool, get along. Well, sir, <laughs> you shall hear of my success. Oh, booby, get along and, and damn your bubbles. <laughs> stop it! Stop it! Murder! See! Fire! Stop fire! Stop fire! Oh, sorry, Anthony! Call! Call! Stop! Murder! Fire! Fire? Murder? Where? Oh, he's out of sight, and I'm out of breath for my part. Ah. Oh, Sir Anthony, why didn't you stop him? Stop whom? Stop uh, Jack? Who? I please you, Sir Anthony. There's all kinds of murder, all sorts of slaughter to be seen in the fields. There's fighting going on, sir. Bloody sword and gun fighting. Who are going to fight, Dunce? Who? Oh. Everybody that I know of, Sir Anthony. Everybody's going to fight. My master, Sir Lucius Sir Trigger, your son, the captain. Oh, the dog I see is Trix. Do you know the place? King's Mayfields. Come along, come along, the, the lying villain. I shall be in such a frenzy. And here upon King's Mead Fields, the cost of passion laid bare. Lovers spurned against suitors never courted, and not a level head to be found upon any of their shoulders. Can they be saved by the greater virtues of chivalry? For or fall victim upon the blade of its darker vices. We shall soon see. In our Mr. Akers, in case of an accident, is there any little weird or commission I could execute for you? Yeah, I'm much obliged to you, Sir Lucius, but I don't understand. Really, you think there's no being shot at without a little risk? And if an unlucky bullet should carry a quietus with it, I say it will be no time then to be bothering you about family matters. A quietus? Hmm, for instance now, if that should be the case, would you choose to be uh, pickled and sent home, or would it be the same to you to lie here in the Abbey? I, I'm told there's, there's this very snug lying in the abbey. Pickled? There's snug lying in the abbey? Odds oh, trimmers, Sir Lucius, don't talk so. Uh, I'm sure they don't mean to disappoint us. Oh, no, eh, I think I see them coming. <sighs> what? Uh, well, let them come. Mm. Hey, Sir Lucius, mm. we, uh, we... We, we, he won't run? Run? No. I say, we won't run by my valor. What's the devil's a matter with you? Uh, nothing. Nothing. Uh, my, my dear friend, my dear Sir Lucius, but I, 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 I don't feel quite so bold somehow as I did. I consider your honor. Oh, my true, my honor. I... Do, Sir Lucius, edge in a word or two every now and then about my honor. Valor will come and go. Hey, then pray keep it fast while you have it. Sir Lucius, mm. it is going. Mm. Oh, yes, my valor is certainly going. Oh. It is sneaking off. I feel it oozing out. Oh, here they are. Gentlemen, you're most obedient. Oh, what? Not an absolute. Aye, so I suppose, sir, you've come here just like myself to do a kind office. First for your friend, then to proceed to business on your own account. What, Jack? Uh, my dear Jack, uh, my dear friend. Harky, Bob, Beverly is at hand. Well, Mr. Akers, I don't blame you saluting a gentleman civilly. So, Mr. Beverly, if you choose your weapons, the cutman and I will measure the ground. My weapons, sir? 
Odd's life, Sir Lucius, I'm not going to fight Mr. Falkland. These are my particular friends. What, sir, did you not come here to fight Mr. Akers? I'll bear my disappointment like a Christian. Uh. Looky, Sir Lucius, there's no occasion at all for me to fight. And if it is the same to you, I, I just as leave it alone. Well, it has served me, Mr. Akers. I must not be trifled with. You most certainly challenge somebody. And you came here to fight him. Now, if that gentleman is willing to represent him, well, I can't see for my soul why it isn't just the same thing. Why, no. Oh, well, Sir Lucius, I tell you, tis one Beverly I've challenged. What? A fellow you see that dare not show his face. If he were here, I'd make him give up his pretensions directly. Hold, Bob. Let me set you right. There is no such man as Beverly in the case. The uh -huh. person who assumed that name is before you. Oh, this is lucky. Now you have an opportunity. <laughs> oh, what quarrel with my dear friend Jack Absolute? Oh, uh, not if there were 50 Beverleys. Oh, upon me, conscious Mr. Akers, your valor has oozed away with a vengeance. Not in the least. I'll be your second with all my heart. And if you should get a quietus, you may command me entirely. I'll get you snug and lying in the abbey here or pickle you with the greatest pleasure. You are little better than a coward. Nay, Sir Lucius. You can't have a better second than my friend Akers. He is the most determined dog called in the country fighting Bob. He generally kills a man a week, don't you, Bob? I, uh, at home. Well then, Captain, tis we must begin. So come out, me little counsellor, and ask the gentleman whether he will resign the lady without forcing you to proceed against him. Come then, sir. Since you won't let it be an amicable suit, here is my reply. <laughs> Knock them all down, sweet Sir Anthony! Put up, Jack, put up, or I shall be in a frenzy. How came you in a duel, sir? Faith, sir, that gentleman can tell you better than I. T'was he called on me without explaining his reasons. Gad, sir, how, could, how came you to call my son out without explaining your reasons? Your son, sir, insulted me in a manner which my owner could not brook. Soons, Jack, how does you insult the gentleman in a manner in which his honour could not brook? Hey, um, let's have no honour before ladies. A uh, Captain Absolute, come here. How could you intimidate us so? Here's Lydia has been terrified to death of you. For fear I should be killed or escape, ma'am. Nay, no delusions to the past. Uh, Lydia is convinced. Uh, speak, child. With your leave, ma'am, I, I must put in a word here. I, I believe I could, you know, interpret the young lady's silence. Now, mark me. What else do you I mean, sir? Come, come, Delia. We must be serious now. This is no time for trifling. It is true, sir, and your reproof bids me offer this gentleman my hand and solicit the return of his affections. Uh, oh, my, my angel, say you so? Uh, Sir Lucius, I perceive there must be some mistake here. For regard to the affront which you affirm I have given you, I can only say that it could not have been intentional. Captain, give me your hand. An affront handsomely acknowledge becomes an obligation. And as for the lady, if she chooses to deny her own handwriting, here. Mm? Oh, he will dissolve my mystery. Sir Lucius, uh, perhaps there's some mistake. Uh, perhaps I can illuminate. Pray, pray, oh gentlewoman, <laughs> don't you interfere where you got no business. Now, Miss hmm, Langwish, are you my daily or not? Indeed, Sir Lucius, I am not. What? Sir Lucius a trigger. Ungrateful as you are, I own the soft impeachment. Uh, Pardon my blushes. I am Delia. Ooh, you're Delia. <laughs> Poor 
Chris Van Dyke. Those letters are mine. <laughs> You are more sensible of my benignity. Uh, perhaps I may be brought to encourage your addresses? This is Malaprop. Uh, I am extremely sensible of your, of your condescension. And whether you or Lucy have put this trick on me, I am equally oh. beholden to you. Come, Mrs. Malaprop, don't be cast down. You are in your bloom yet. <laughs> Oh, Sir Anthony, men are all barbarians. He seems dejected and unhappy, not sullen. There was some foundation, however, for the tale he told me. Hello? Can you speak a little out with Falkland? Uh, Julia, how can I sue for what so little deserve? I do not presume, yet hope is the child of penitence. Oh, Falkland, although you have been faulty in your unkind treatment of me, I am now in wanting inclination to resent it. As my heart honestly bids me place my weakness to the account of love, I should be ungenerous not to admit the same plea for yours. Now I shall be blessed indeed. <laughs> What's going on here? So you have been quarrelling too? I warrant. C come, Julia. I never interfered before, but let me have a hand in this matter at last. All the faults I've ever seen in my friend Falkland here seem to proceed from what he calls his, well, the delicacy and warmth of his affection for you. There. Well, marry him directly, Julia. You'll find he'll mend surprisingly. Come now, I hope there's no dissatisfied person. Well, what is content? For as I have been disappointed myself, it will be very hard if I have not the satisfaction of seeing other people succeed better. You are right, Sir Lucius. So, Jack, I wish you joy. Mr. Falkland the same. Gad, sir, I like your spirit. And at night, we single lads will drink a health to the young couples and a husband for Mrs. Malaprop. <laughs> Jack, I hope to be congratulated by each other. Yours for having checked in time the errors of an ill-directed imagination, which might have been betrayed in an innocent heart. And mine, for having by her gentleness and candor, we formed the unhappy temper of one, who by it made wretched whom he loved most and torture the heart he ought to have adored. Well, Falkland, we have both tasted the bitters as well as the sweets of love with this difference only, that you always prepare the bitter cup for yourself, whereas I- You look always obliged to me for it, eh? Mr. Modesty? Ah, oh, but come, no more of that. Our happiness is now as unalloyed as general. Then let us study to preserve it so. And while hope pictures to us a flattering scene of future bliss, let us not deny its pencil those colours which are too bright to be lasting. Ladies, for you I heard our playwright say, he'd try to coax some moral from his play. One moral's plain, cried I, without more fuss. Man's social happiness all rests on us. Through all the drama, whether damned or not, love gilds the scene and women guide the plot. From every rank, obedience is our due. Do you doubt? The world's great stage shall prove it true. Thank you for joining our online production of The Rivals. I'd like to introduce the cast. The narrator played by Anne Hubble. Fogg played by Craig Courier. Thomas played by Corey Warren. Lucy played by Sherry Gullerud. Lydia Languish played by Zora Richardson. The wonderful Julia was Jessica Andrade. Mrs. Malaprop, Angelique de Morgan. Sir Anthony Absolute. Jeff McMahon, Captain Absolute, Andrew Lanahan, Falkland, Carson Davis, 
Bob Akers by Pat Perdue, Sir Lucius Otrigger, Ryan McWayne, David was Thomas Weaver, and our wonderful understudies, Brianna Manassa and Ariel Hicks. Thank you very much.